how do I come in and tell this story and do it in a way, you know, which is the, which honors nothing about us without us, you know, which honors the idea that like, this is a community that's been underrepresented and misrepresented for a really long time. So if I'm going to be the person to tell this story, I better have people around me who've lived that experience who can speak to it better than I can. One of the first pieces I read, it had read at Tuesdays at nine was, um, was the script that became mother eventually. And I had been working as a babysitter in all these four-star hotels in LA, which was a super weird, upsetting experience a lot of the time. And I wrote a scene based on it and, and, and brought it into that group and heard it, actors read it on stage. And, and it was funny and tragic and all these kind of interesting things. And I thought, oh, this is a cool tone it's cool like this is an interesting area to navigate because it's simultaneously really tragic and really funny um and that was the script that i ended up applying to afi with was that script that i started writing through that group but i i didn't know i was a director until i was on set doing it and then i felt totally in my element and i felt like oh this uses every part of me and this is the perfect combination kind of of all of where the way my brain works, the way I think about story, the way I want to work with actors kind of, oh, this is a great use of me as a person. It was a process of discovery for me. It was like, is this, and everyone else sort of felt more experienced than I was, or like they'd been in the business longer, or kind of savvier about things. I remember asking what a gaffer was, you know, very early on at AFI and getting a lot of scoffs. Um, and, but that's kind of where I was at. And I think it wasn't until I had the experience of kind of starting the process of prepping and directing that I thought, oh, of course, this is exactly what I should be doing. Coda died at the studio, guys. Like Coda was at Lionsgate and it was dead. Nobody was gonna make it there. And it was like, okay, well, that was it. That was my for you know, I wrote this thing. I really care about it. And the studio is never going to make it and they own it and there's nothing we can do. And when Patrick Washburger left Lionsgate, he took it with him as part of his exit package. And we made it fully independently outside of the studio system. It was nuts and I didn't get to have it, you guys. I mean, it's like your dream moment as a filmmaker. Like, can you imagine if someone had told me like, you're gonna win everything at Sundance, but guess what? You're gonna be in your house with your five-year-old and your seven-year-old and you're not gonna get anything. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was like everything you could have dreamed of. And actually in a way, honestly, like, the fact that the movie did what it did when we were not together kind of was a, was a beautiful thing. Like that people, cause I just didn't know how that was going to go virtually to have people sitting in their houses, you know, not sitting in the Eccles because something happens at Sundance, honestly, where like, you know, movies get this, you get in a theater at the Eccles and people freak out over a movie. And it's almost like this, it takes on a life of its own. And I was like, how is this going to work with people watching the movie alone in their houses and, you know, separated? And so to have that experience at Sundance was so mind blowing. What is the dying working class of America? Like, what, where are those communities? And I think when I say that I grew up in Gloucester, like that was a place that I had seen it happen. I'd seen the town that was built on this industry kind of collapse and, and the waterfront that used to be all these like processing plants and busy and all these businesses that catered to the fishing industry kind of collapse along with the fishing industry. And the people that got hurt the most were these family fishermen. And so it really felt like, oh, this is a cool place to set the story and to set the Rossies as this like, you know, kind of isolated fishing family who are in this generational business where you pass along your boat to your child and they're going to go out to sea and do what you did. And I think there was a kind of added pressure to that. I mean, I felt like there was pressure on Ruby because she's a coda and obviously they live, they're poor and they live in a small town. And so there's not access to interpreters in the way that there are in 
major cities or in places where you have resources. But the added pressure of like, they don't just need her to stay because they're deaf. They need her to stay because this is the family business and it's a family operation. And I think even with a hearing child, there would be pressure for that kid to stay and carry on that family business. And so it sort of balanced the story to me in a way that felt important. So I went in and pitched to them. They liked my take. They didn't immediately commit to me as a director. They hired me as a writer. And I think they were waiting to see what kind of script I would come up with to see if I had to, you know, could then land it as a director. I always put the personal in my writing somehow, you know, I think, yes, I did not grow up in a deaf family, but I was a child of immigrants, you know, both my parents were immigrants, I felt like I understood what that was to have a cultural difference with your parents and feel like you don't fully get me as an American kid. Um, I also grew up with, as you guys have seen crazy artist parents who were like, way too loose about language and you know I remember like getting in trouble at school for swearing and they were like what would your parents say if they heard you talk like this I'm like this is how my parents talk you know like you know my they were way too open about their sex life in front of my friends like all of those kind of scenes felt like they felt like my family and we were also a family that used humor to deal with each other in situations and um and were incredibly tight-knit to the point that when I was a teenager and leaving home I felt like I didn't know how to be who I was outside of my family. My identity was so wrapped up in them that, you know, and even now when I go home, it's like my husband was home with us this summer. I was visiting my parents and my sister was there. And like, you know, my sister goes, I'm going to go walk the dog. And my dad's like, well, I'll go with you. And I'm like, I'll go with you. And suddenly like, you know, six people are walking the dog. And David's like, can one person just walk the dog without all of you walking the dog together? It's so weird that you all have to be together all the time. <laughs> so that line when Ruby says, you know, I've never done anything without my family before, like that, those were lines that came from me. They were, those were lines that were about separation and finding it very hard to kind of separate in that way from the people that you love who make you who you are. the way that I handled, I think being an outsider to the deaf community and like, how do I come in and tell this story and do it in a way, you know, which is, the, which honors nothing about us without us, you know, which honors the idea that like, this is a community that's been underrepresented and misrepresented for a really long time. So if I'm gonna be the person to tell this story, I better have people around me who've lived that experience who can speak to it better than I can. Um, and listen to those people and be open in a way that I'm the conduit and sort of there to facilitate the storytelling. With the fishermen, it's interesting because, you know, I think people want their stories told accurately um, and they do get something out of it. You know, I think that community feels seen. 